why do we need to protect the model and the data? Of course, we know that. So what happens if the model gets stolen? Model can get stolen, right? So you, are, you lose the intellectual property that comes with the model. Uh, think of another story where the input that you interact with the model, right? Let's say you are, we are talking about a health chatbot where you are kind of sending inputs which are confidential in nature, your health-related queries that you are sending to the bot, to the chatbot, and then it returns. What if that data gets lost? Which means there is a reputational damage to your, because if that data gets lost, and also loss of user's trust, how the users will trust you if you cannot safeguard the data, right? And not, not the least that, uh, of course, your competitive advantage is also lost. So model protection and, of course, the data protection is very important. Now, the question is, how do you protect the model and data? Of course, what we do today, right? Currently, we have various ways. So, so if we consider security as a layered uh, onion, then what happens? You have APIs. So we, we are considering APIs and the models, and key thing is the model. So you can encrypt the model at rest. And of course, when, when the data that comes uh, to the model, it's all encrypted in transit. So you use encryption to protect the data that you already use. You also have uh, role-based access controls, right, to kind of protect it. Then you also have uh, API security in place. So these are the usual stuff. You will have network policies, firewalls, right, segmentations and all, and of course, auditing and logging. Now, in this whole thing, do you see anything missing? So this, I, I believe, if, if you are familiar in the sense of uh, in the infrastructure side and protecting, these are common, right? These are table stakes today. Without this, anyway, we won't run a real application in production. But do you see anything missing from this? Okay. No, sir. I think this was just a leading question. Now, what I will do is I will show you a small demo, right? Which is... Uh, so this is basically a demo which we are running on a single node Kubernetes cluster for ease of use. So for a moment, uh, so let me just, uh, okay. So for a moment, you wear the hat of an infrastructure admin who has access to the Kubernetes worker nodes. So I, I would want you to imagine that you can access the Kubernetes worker node. And this is a very simple demo with what it does. It just uh, creates a simple pod which downloads a secret and keeps it in the memory. That's all. It's a very simple uh, program. So let's uh, get started. As you see, this is a single node Kubernetes cluster. And it downloads the secret. So this, we run it as part of a pod. Right? So this is the pod. And uh, you see the what it does, it just do a curl, get the secret, and uh, keeps it. And then sleeps. So yes, the pod is running. Now, since we are using the same node, now this is where uh, you are an admin who has access to the node. What I'm going to do as an admin is search uh, the process, which is uh, sleeping. So we'll see that. So I got the PID, and once I get the PID, I will take a memory dump of this process. I took a memory dump. Now, interesting thing is I can grab for the secret in the memory dump. So the secret is available, right? Now, for a moment, assume this is your model, right? So this is your model where you have spent your money to train the model on your custom data. And uh, if there is a malicious privileged admin, they have access to your model weights. Imagine if this is your input data, which is being used. You can get the input data from a memory dump. So that's what, so in spite of all the securities that we have, there is still an attack vector which can be exploited by the admins. This is what we are talking about. Now, what's the solution for this, right? So the solution is confidential compute. Now, what does confidential compute brings in? We'll Take a look at it. Okay. So before we talk about what is confidential computing, let's take a step back 
and look at what's the different stages of the data. Because here what we are talking about is all data. Even your model is a data, right? So what are the different stages that the data goes through? So you have data at rest, of course, right? So you have data at rest. Then you have data in transit. And uh, then you have data that is in use. So hope it comes along. Maybe. Okay. So maybe I'm too far. That's why it's not working. So okay. So what we are talking about here is the three stages of the data: data at rest, data in transit, data in use. I think all of you are familiar with how to protect data at rest. It's encryption. How do you protect data in transit? Again, encryption. We have TLS encryption. Now, the key thing is how do you protect the data in use? Because now, now kind of go back to the previous example, why the admin was able to see the kind of data? Because the data that is in use, which is in memory, it's not protected. It's in plain text. That's why the admin was able to see. Now, what confidential computing brings to the table is it brings encrypt memory encryption, which means it brings encryption for data in use. And that's the beauty of confidential computing. That's what it brings to the table. It completes encryption for the all stages of the data lifecycle, right? Now, little bit detail on the confidential computing. It's a processor technology. It brings or it gives you a trusted execution environment, right? It's a, gives you a trusted, I will talk about what exactly is the trusted execution environment. And then importantly is you can verify remotely the authenticity and trustworthiness of this trusted execution environment. And this trusted execution environment provides memory encryption, runtime memory encryption to be clear. Now, simply put that at the heart of confidential compute is your trusted execution environment. So whatever data that you want to protect if it is in, inside the TE memory, it cannot be accessed or it, it, the plain text cannot be accessed by any privileged entities that is outside of the TE. That's the beauty of confidential computing. Repeating again, the data that needs to be protected. So what, what the secret that we saw, if that secret is inside this TE memory, then no entities outside can see the plain text. That's what T brings in. So the heart of confidential computing is the trusted execution environment. And there are two types of T's, which is uh, VM-based T's. So the T is a full VM. And then there's another type, which is T is a process. So uh, this picture, what I'm trying to do is to see who, which all entities has access to your data. So the first one is your general environment without confidential computing, right? Without confidential computing, if you see all the entities, your infrastructure admin, of course, CPU, BIOS, firmware, post OS, cluster admin, all have access to the data. And we saw in that demo, anyone having access to the worker node takes a memory dump, gets the data. Now, with confidential computing and VMTs, who has access to the data? CPU. So still you need to trust the CPU. So CPU is still trusted. Rest, none of them are trusted. No, none of the other entities in white, like the OS, the hypervisor, the infrastructure admins, don't have access to the data. Basically, the data which is in memory of the VMT. The other option or the other TE type is the process-based TE type, where it's much more granular. It is at the process level. Right? So here we are not kind of going into the details of the pros and cons of the two approaches, right? but just for you to understand what confidential computing brings to the table. The key takeaways, one, you, the data that you want to protect from privileged entities, if you are able to put that data inside the TE, you gain that protection. So that's kind of the takeaway, right? And, and in the subsequent section, our focus will be predominantly on the VM-based TEs. One of the primary reasons for that is the VM-based TEs allows for lift and shift. So you can get your existing application, run it inside a VM-based T, and you can reap the benefits of confidential computing. All right. So with this now, so what's the message? The, one of the key things or one or, or how do you protect? As I said, as long as you can get the data inside the T, you are protected. So then our problem statement becomes, how can I run my workload inside the T? Right? So that's the whole point. So if I am running 
my AI application, the inference in Kubernetes cluster, my main priority to reap the benefit of data in use protection is how do I get that workload inside or how do I get the Kubernetes workload inside the team? Now here we have like two approaches. Either you can run the entire Kubernetes worker node inside a T, and, and if you Google for it, the, the, it is most commonly known as confidential clusters. Right? So you, can you do have various solutions around it. Various vendors are providing that. The other approach is you just put the Kubernetes pod inside the T, and that's what we call as the confidential containers. Right? So it's at the pod level. And, and, and one key thing to remember in these two approaches is about the trust model. And to make it simple, who has access to the data? So when we talk about your confidential cluster, your Kubernetes cluster admin can still access the data. So that Kubernetes cluster admin is still trusted. right? In confidential containers, even the Kubernetes cluster admin is untrusted. So the only trusted entity is the user who is deploying the pod, which means, let's say if I am providing an AI model and I am actually exposing that as a chatbot, I only, me, trust, and, and I am the only trusted user, no one else. And this is enabled by the CNCF sandbox project, confidential containers. So in the subsequent section, so now, this we just added it recently uh, based on the announcement that happened for the cloud native AI white paper. So there also for additional trusted security key is recommended, right? So and the whole thing is that if you want to reap the benefit of memory encryption, you need T and you need a way to deploy the workload inside a T. So in the subsequent section, I hand it over to Suraj, who will take you through how we are enabling the confidential containers and then of course, how it is integrated with an inference runtime, case of, inference, case of inference runtime. What do you say? Thank you, Pranitha. So uh, let, let's talk about confidential containers, right? Um, so before we go into like yeah, how, 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 how it is set up and everything, let's quick, quickly do an overview of Kubernetes. I, th I hope everybody understands this. It's, there is control plane, there are worker nodes, worker nodes have kubelet and everything, right? So what in this, in this talk, what we'll do is zoom into the node, worker node. So imagine you have a regular uh, hardware, and then it's running, like there is a kubelet, of course. Uh, the general interaction is kubelet gets uh, request to start a pod, which talks to container D, which then talks to run C, and a pod is created. That's, that's I think, everybody understands this, this part. So uh, for confidential containers, what we use is something called as Kata containers as a runtime. Uh, how many of you have heard of Kata containers? OK, so to, to give a two-liner uh, information about what Kata does is, so instead of Run-C, which uses Linux kernel-based technologies to start a container, Kata creates a lightweight VM and starts containers inside that VM. So you need to have like a hardware-enabled uh, virtualization enabled hardware uh, for worker nodes. So it's the same again, kubelet gets a request, which it passes to container D, and then it talks to Kata runtime. So Kata runtime is basically a replacement for run C here. And Kata runtime is, is the CRI enabled, so it knows how to re uh, get requests from, or understand requests from container D. And then on the other side, it knows how to talk to virtualization softwares, like KVM in this case. It's the same again, uh, virtual, virtual, but a virtual machine is created in this case. Virtual machine boots up, and the first process that starts in this virtual machine is called Kata agent. And then Kata runtime and Kata agent communicate on like how to, how to start a real pod. And then the image pull happens, and the Kubernetes pod comes up. So that's the general interaction, right? Now, what Confidential Containers has done is they have extended the Kata project so that it can start confidential VMs. Again, so let's see Kata CC. So this time we need a hardware that has support for confidential compute, like AMDs, SEV SNP, or Intel CDX. So again, kubelet, container D, Kata runtime, KVM starts, virtual, virtual machine boots up. There is Kata agent. But <clears throat> we also have something called as confidential data hub and attestation agent. So like Pradipta mentioned earlier, right? So attestation is a really important part of this whole 
process. Because just starting a VM with encrypted memory, like you could, like you could be fooled by the underlying infrastructure provider. That's not what we want. We want like to really ensure we are. I mean, this is for really paranoid users who don't trust anything outside that 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 VM, that TE that we are talking about here. So the attestation happens, and this relying party is is something that you have on your your side, your secure side, trusted side. Which knows how to read this evidence and verify. Oh, this evidence was really signed by the AMD hardware or the Intel hardware. So this is how you ensure you are really in a safe environment. And that's after that, what you do after you ensure you are in a safe environment is up to you. You can release a key. You can release a secret. You can just be okay. This is a trusted thing and go ahead. So in in this case, we have uh, we are releasing a key. We are releasing a key for an encrypted container image. So uh, the container image is uh, pulled. The key is used to decrypt the container image and the pod stops. So in this way, what we ensure that if attestation fails, we are not downloading anything. Even if it's downloaded, for that matter, it's since the image is encrypted, uh, you are you, you are fine because the key won't be released until uh, until attestation passes. So quickly, let's look at the Cocoa threat model or the confidential containers. Uh, we call it Cocoa uh, in short. So it, it promises confidentiality and uh, uh, and integrity from the CIA tried, like from the traditional security, uh, uh, when they try to assess anything, uh, they look at the CIA tried. So confidentiality is guaranteed because images, uh, sorry, the uh, memory is encrypted, and uh, integrity is guaranteed because you're only pulling stuff after ensuring everything is fine. Like the, you can you can test uh, during attestation, you can test stuff like like this is the the kernel that I wanted, this is the init RD I wanted, the kernel parameters were right. Like you can. Ensure the whole world is whole world inside the T is fine, and then attestation passes, and everything outside trusted. Like uh, like I said, everything outside this VM, this uh, TE is is untrusted. The worker node is untrusted. That's that's the uh, Cocoa Threat model uh, that we follow. So uh, like we saw before, uh, we saw a demo about uh, unencrypted memory. Let's let's see what the uh, encrypted memory looks like. So again, we have the same uh, VM uh, that that we saw earlier, and uh, this since this is a single node cluster, we are ensuring that it has this uh, kernel model loaded, the SEV SNP uh, kernel model. And to get started with co confidential containers, we install uh, the confidential containers operator. The operator uh, exposes runtime classes. So Kata also exposes runtime class. That's how you can boot up Kata pods or config. Uh, yeah, and this is the same uh, thing from before. The thing that we have changed here is the Kata uh, QMU, right? So the same thing happens. We are uh, pulling in the, we are getting the secret and then storing it in in an ENV. The pod has started. It's a regular Kata. It's not it's not confidential yet. So it shows that the runtime class is there. Uh, we are downloaded the secret. Now it's sleeping. <clears throat> this time we did not uh, graph for uh, sleep because uh, we graphed for QMU because uh, it, the VM is running inside or the pod is running inside this QMU VM. We get the PID again uh, and then do a core dump again. And then once we get that core file, we look at the ASCII representation of the secret, and yeah, you can you can see even with Kata VM, you can see uh, yeah, this thing exists. Sorry about that. So uh, yeah, moving on. So uh, for this talk, what we have chosen is we have chosen this one uh, model serving platform or inferencing platform on Kubernetes called Kso. And uh, yeah, let's 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 do a quick primer of what Kso is. So it's a it's an inferencing platform. It can host various uh, forms of models, uh, whether you are trained using TensorFlow or PyTorch or uh, all of these lists. And uh, 
yeah you 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 can use like regular crs and crds and it has all the controllers and you get like a consistent uh, you can run it across various kubernetes uh, deployments and it gets all the kubernetes benefits like ha bin packing auto scaling all of that and the auto attack vectors that case uh, case of uh, are like there could be a data or model poisoning somebody does privacy breach like they see what inputs and outputs are uh that they, they steal the model itself or there is denial of service but what we are focusing today is just model theft right so l- let's see how these two can can work together so let me open another thing Okay, so let me restart. <laughs> yeah. So, uh. It, this time again we are seeing that it's running in a confidential container system like we have this operator uh, deployed and uh, we deploy uh, the case of controller is also deployed already uh, with a with a with a specific model uh, we will deploy a specific model now we have runtime class uh, created so this time we are using kata remote runtime class it's uh, so kat in the kata confidential containers we support multiple uh, ways of deploying stuff uh, the the specific thing that we are using here is called kata remote where it creates a peer vm it's out of, outside the scope of this talk but uh, understand it's confidential vm and in this uh, example that you see uh, that we have we specify the kata remote and we have this storage uri so for case of you can specify where to pull your model from in this case we are using a container image to ship a model this is uh, this new feature uh, i think uh, roland implemented it uh, for the case of community it's called a model car where you use the model to ship your uh, you use the container image to ship the model and the good thing about this particular image is it's encrypted like you saw before uh, it's a, it's a, let's let's deploy this so while this deployment happen we'll look at, take a closer look at what this image looks like so we'll use copio to do the inspection of this particular image and yeah so scopio gives you like uh, information about each layer and since we have encrypted using the coco's uh, encryption stack it it shows you that there is attestation agents uh, information and if we also look at like uh, one of these layers uh, we see it's it's base64 encoded and the base64 encoding looks like this so this is where there is information about where to get the key from so when it talks to the relying party that we saw on the on the on the right side before so it ta- it knows like this is where the key lives on the uh, key broker service and once it gets the key it can uh, decrypt the uh, decrypt the container image and if we if we go and pull this image today you'll you'll see error something like invalid tar header because it's encrypted right even if you use some other mo- method of getting that image it's a encrypted blob so yeah and the relying party that we showed earlier on the right side right? currently we have deployed it on the same cluster you should ideally be deploying it in some uh, in production scenarios you would deploy in a trusted setup here we are showing like okay this has like all uh, like how the attestation happened here and like how the keys were uh, how the keys were queried and and stuff like that so moving ahead you can see like uh, the pod that we deployed like a couple of minutes earlier it's deployed now and uh, if we try to get information about its runtime class it it is deployed in that particular vm so this is this is all case of a uh, way of uh, exporting like uh, env wars and everything this is from the case of documentation there is nothing new this is the input that will provide to the model and then yeah so this is 
So now we are querying the model uh, with the with the input, and in the end we get this prediction, which is one one, which is which is what we expect. So uh, yeah, moving on. Uh, so case of confidential containers, uh, what we have done is what or what we are doing is we are running those parts of the case of that will expose the model or will host the model inside confidential containers. That's why you see like only parts of it. You don't want to run everything in confidential containers if if it's not needed, right? Or on the if we look at the data plane, we are running like the the predictor side of it. So moving on, like uh, what, what what benefits uh, do you see, uh, or what what benefits Coco uh, provides to Queso, right? Of of course, like memory encryption, we have been harping on it for a while. So uh, that's that's the obvious one. Protection from the infrastructure providers, uh, query input output is also protected because it's going to an encrypted uh, place. And then, yeah, there there are a bunch of other uh, use cases as well. Like it's not just Queso here that we are. Queso was just one example that we picked, but uh, the other ones could be like multiple parties coming together and trying to do computation on same thing, same app, same uh, same data. So that you are ensuring that no other party is not stealing the uh, the 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 other party's data. So and regulatory compliance, like, right? Like in here in Europe, especially where data protection laws are pretty uh, stringent, uh, this is becoming more and more into the law that you are, when you are processing some IP, you have to have it uh, encrypted when it's being used. And yeah, I think we talked about the PII data. So further work uh, around this would be uh, using confidential GPUs, like even even in training, because if you are training on a lot of uh, sensitive data, you would want the GPUs to be also uh, confidential. And today, uh, NVIDIA's the H100s or all the H series uh, support confidential uh, memory. So once this becomes available, generally, uh, we could we could start uh, using that. And then in the case of side, uh, we can uh, we need support for a runtime class name, uh, so that we can uh, yeah use the model uh, model mesh. So uh, what are the takeaways, right? So con so I, I think like even if you forget everything in uh, from today's talk, remember that confidential uh, containers provides uh, data protection when it's being used. Uh, Coco can help in every aspect wherever you think that when it's in memory, somebody can access it. It's it's protected, and then uh, model serving platforms from like Kesa or anything uh, can benefit from Coco, and then not everything needs to run inside Coco. You decide where your data is getting exposed to the underlying hardware or underlying hardware owners. Uh, that's that's the only thing that should run in confidential containers. So yeah, uh, this is confidential containers project. If you uh, would like to get involved, uh, that's the QR code there and uh, I think we can take questions now. Yeah, we can take questions. One key thing to note is uh, what we are trying to do as part of Confidential Containers Project is to make is, is focus on usability. As you saw in the demo, all that is needed once you have the infrastructure set up in place, all that is needed to convert a regular pod into a confidential pod is to use the right runtime class which provides the necessary uh, infrastructure right to run that. So that's kind of our goal um, and yeah I think you have other sessions also in the same yeah uh, area I have one more session in the in the evening but it's around spire if you are interested uh, please please come see there and uh, and yeah questions yeah. Uh, yeah you can shout out or you can come to the mic uh, in front here Thank you. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about the impact on the performances. Do you have any metrics? Um, I can take that. So sometime back, AMD released performance benchmarks for running a set of macro and micro benchmarks on confidential instances versus regular instances. So typically for uh, many of the micro benchmarks, the performance hit was less than 4%. So they ran uh, even the JVM performance uh, benchmark they ran, that was also Monte Carlo simulation also was done, it was less than 4%. 
the spec core benchmark, which is the core CPU benchmark, that was 8% uh, performance decay. So that's a public documentation. So if you look for uh, AMD, SEV, SNMP performance, so you will get those uh, data. My question was the same. Uh, and is that documentation in the uh, confidential container um, site? That, uh, the, the, the performance metrics that you just stated? No, I don't think so it is there, but that's a good suggestion. Maybe we can add that in the, in the, in the website as well. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My question is quite a lot simpler. Um, in terms of on-prem and in the cloud, what are the requirements from an infrastructure? Because not all chips are born the same. So that was my question. Yeah, uh, that's also another thing so far. See, the core hardware requirement for, mem for uh, confidential computing is, uh, is having CPUs uh, which supports uh, confidential computing. Uh, so, for example, Intel TDX or AMD, uh, SNMP, PIC processor. Now, hardware requirement for on-prem is to have bare metal uh, systems which supports these processor types. So, that's the minimum hardware requirement for your on-prem. So, you need bare metal servers with the right processor supporting this capability. Could you do... I, I can add to that, like even the, uh, all the Epic, uh, Epic series from AMD, they have confidential yes. uh, compute uh, capability there. And since this is coming from hardware, it is enabled on the kernel, uh, the virtualization softwares. So it's like right from the hardware stack up until where we see this application. I just checked your website from the adopter side, because I was curious. Looks like Microsoft are doing it already in preview from what I've seen. And apparently AWS also support it. But I'm just wondering, do you need bare metal instances of AWS instances and Azure instances to use this? Or can you just use a normal VM? Okay. So when we are using confidential compute in public cloud today, we can use the confidential VM instances Okay. Right, and the demo that uh, Suraj showed with Kser that actually used uh, confidential VM VMs in Azure. Mm -hmm. Right, so we can do that. And when you are doing bare metal, or when you are doing on-prem, there we need bare metal. Okay. okay. One last question: Can you use trusted zones in ARM? Uh, not yet. Not yet. All right, that's fine. Thank you. I think we are out of time. We if you have more time. questions, you can Yeah, we are here. Yeah. So if you have more questions, we'll be happy to take it. Thank you, folks. Thanks for attending.